Hi everyone, it's Katie back with another edition of my vlog and I hope you enjoyed my intro to shibori techniques video that I posted last week. And as promised, I'm back with another shibori tutorial this week. And this time I wanna teach you guys how to make a kumo or spider web binding, which is my absolute favorite out of all the different ones that I've tried. It is the big one that's behind me. That is one giant spider web. I also have a few examples of it at smaller scale, um, but actually because this one is my total favorite, um, I use it up faster than anything else. So I have a sample of indigo dyed um, Kumo spider webs there. Um, this has been quilted because like I said, I like to use this stuff, but you can see what the bare fabric itself would look like without the quilting on there. Also, I have a couple of other samples that are different colors. Um, I made this one a couple of years ago. I was messing around with a dye called Alkanet, which makes this cool gray color. So there is a Alkanet spider web. And I hope you can see the reason why it's called spider web. It really looks like a spider web and there's always that little dot right in the center. And that's supposed to be the spider sitting in her web. I love it. Um, I have even messed around doing this same technique using bleach on fabric. This piece of fabric was actually red to begin with. And I bound it up into those spider web shapes and then I put the whole thing in bleach instead of binding up a white piece of fabric and dyeing it. So you can see kind of the inverted effect of what the spider webs wind up looking like if you take away color instead of adding it. Um, and then the other thing that I wanna show you today along with the spider web technique is what I like to call bubbles, which is basically the same as the spider web, but it's open. Instead of completing the entire spider web design, you just get the ring around the outside and you don't get those um, spokes leading to the center and the spider sitting in the center of her web. Um, I think this one's really cool too. Obviously I've used it in a lot of um, my masks that I've been posting up for sale. As you can see, the bottom of the fabric is cut into a wavy line because I have been using it for masks. So um, without further ado, let's learn how to do a Kumo spider web binding. All right, I've got my supplies and I'm ready to go. For this binding, I need my fabric that I'm gonna bind up and I need a spool of heavy duty thread. Um, I use upholstery thread. This stuff is much thicker than regular sewing thread and it's much harder to break. I can still break it if I pull on it too hard, so do be careful with that. You can use even thicker twine if you want to. Um, I've found that this is about as thick as I need to go and just from an economic perspective, I don't wanna have to buy more expensive than I need to. Um, so that's all you need to do this binding. I also do have a tool that I've made. Um, I've done this binding so many times that I made myself this little funky table spike. It's actually made out of a thread stand with a chopstick duct tape to it. So very low tech, um, but I use that uh, just to make the job a little bit easier. So here's how you do it. Pick where you want your spider web to be. Find kind of the center of the invisible spider web on your fabric. Let's make one about this big right here. So either pinch it and pull it up kind of exactly the same way we did uh, when we were making the target design last week, or this is where I would use my little spike tool. I just hang it right on that point and it gives me a great place to sort of work from. But again, you don't have to use any kind of tool to do this. You just need to sort of pinch the fabric into the shape you want it to be and decide how big you want that circle to be. The next thing is to unwind a little bit of your thread and give yourself a slip knot in the end of it. You guys know how to make a slip knot. You loop the thread around itself, reach back through that loop, pull the thread through, and there is your slip knot. Take the loop from the slip knot and put it over your shape loosely. Don't, don't wanna tighten it up yet. Then, as with all shibori designs, it is all in how you control the fabric folds and pleats. So you wanna make sure your fabric is nice and evenly arranged, nothing is bunched too far into the center. A reminder, anything that's in the center is gonna remain white. Anything that is uh, showing on the outside layer is what is gonna turn blue. So pretty much when you've got your spike about the shape you want it to be, you pinch the bottom and then tighten up on that 
slip knot. You're not going to be able to tighten it all the way just due to the way the thread itself works, but you just want it to kind of hold your, your basic shape in place for you there, okay? Tighten it up as much as you can, but if it slips back out, that's fine. Um, the next thing I like to do is I like to tighten up my thread quite a bit on the spool, and I hold it in my hand between those two fingers so the thread is coming out and so that I can just pull on it and pull really tightly and get a nice firm uh, tension on there. Um, sometimes I take it out of my hand and I wind it back a little closer just so I can get a little closer in. I hold it between these two fingers so that I can keep my uh, first fingers on my dominant hand free to manipulate fabric, okay? So then with this in my hand, I'm gonna pull this tighter. Oh, look, I just broke it, just like I said. Don't pull on it too hard. Let's start over. Good lesson right there, all right. Go ahead and make a little slip knot. Put it over. Hey, how about we don't pull it too tight this time? Seems like a really good idea. So I'm gonna pull it that tight, but not any tighter. Get my thread ready to do the rest of the binding and then not pull so hard on it that I break the thread. And at this point, I'm actually gonna slide it up the chopstick a little bit so that I can pull it even tighter without breaking the thread. And I'm gonna wrap it around two or three times at the base of this spike to kind of get that a little bit more under control, okay? At this point, what I usually do is lift it up off the spike because I actually don't want that chopstick in the middle while I'm doing the rest of the binding. It's gonna get in the way of the, uh, the fabric. If there is something in the middle there as I'm winding it up and then I try to take it off of the spike, it's gonna to be too tight. And then once I actually get it off the spike, it has too much empty space inside of it and the shape starts collapsing on itself. So I just actually use it to get to here. And this is in fact what I was talking about earlier when I said bubbles. I got an example of bubbles right here to remind you guys. So this is the spider web design that we're working on right now. But if I just stop right here and I don't do any more of the binding, what I wind up with are the open circles that I call the bubbles. And that's beautiful also, right? So if you like that look, what you wanna do is just, just go that far and then move on to the next one on your fabric. But we're gonna keep going, we're gonna make the spider web. So to make the spider web, again, you're gonna pull your fabric up, turn it around, make sure those pleats look how you want them to look, okay? And then once you've got it how you want it, you've wrapped a few times at the base so it's nice and secure, you start wrapping up the length of the spike in a spiral shape. See how I'm doing that? And then as you make each turn around, you can pull the thread a little tighter. Again, not so tight that you break it, but just to snug it up because of course, as I'm going up the length of this spike, I'm getting narrower and narrower because there's less and less fabric in the middle of it. So keep turning, keep adjusting your pleats. Notice if you've got you know, a lumpy part with too much fabric turned towards the inside, Keep spiraling around right up to the top. Keep pulling it a little bit tighter. Again, not tight enough to break the thread. So you've got a nice sort of a unicorn horn spiral, right? When you get right up to the top, just a few millimeters away from the top, what you're gonna wanna do is just wrap the thread really tightly about five or six times around there and really snug that up. Again, don't break your thread so that the top looks like that. That little white piece right on the top is gonna to wind up being the spider sitting in the center of her web. Now that we've got that spiral done, one half of our spider web is done, and now we just have to continue back down the spiral, crisscrossing the thread with the thread that we brought up, pull it snug, but not too tight, back down to the bottom where you started, and then wrap around a few more times. Once you get to there, you're done. That's it, that's all you have to do, except we have to secure the thread so that this doesn't just unravel. So what I do here is I give myself a little loop and I double it back on itself. It kind of creates a little lock. Put it over the top of that, pull on it, 
snug it down, not too tight. You don't want to break your thread. And that is one spider web binding. Now, what I can do is I can continue across this fabric and make another one nearby or far away. Let's make another one here. I'm just gonna situate this on my little spike. Again, you don't have to use a tool like this. I just find it incredibly easy to do this very first step. But you can just sort of pinch it in your hands. Now, you don't need to make a uh, slip knot for this second one, but what you do need to do is give yourself a little bit of slack. So I kind of hold the thread out to one side with my left hand, oops, and then go around the bottom, kind of where I think I'm gonna want this circle to be, and then pull my fabric down into the right sort of pleats that I wanna see, and then snug it up, leaving a little bit of slack between this one and the one before it so that this loop of thread isn't too tight. Um, pull it a little bit tight, give it maybe a couple more around, snug it down, take it off the spike, pull it tighter, don't break your thread. And then again, pull that center part up, arrange your pleats how you want them, spiral up and around, keeping a nice firm tension on the thread, not tight enough to break it, but tight enough to make this a nice, solid little spiral shape. I'm gonna get to the top. I'm gonna go around a couple more times. There's that spider sitting on the top of her web. And then I'm going to spiral back down the length of that spike, just like that. So now I have two different size spider webs that are gonna be kind of near to each other on this piece of fabric. When you get to the last one you wanna do, however many you have on your thing, just go around a few more times, cut your thread. Ooh, I do not have scissors here. Well, pretend you can cut your thread and then give it a little loop back around and tie it around itself, okay? That's it. That's the spider web binding. Now I have one here that I made yesterday that has a whole bunch of different size spider webs. And you can see how they kind of all relate to each other. You can see there's a lot of these loose threads going in between everyone, but that's fine. I also, you can see, made a couple of those empty uh, bubble ones alongside of the spider webs so that I will get a cool effect where I have lots of different sizes of spider webs on this fabric, and then a few of those bubble patterns in between the spider webs. The other really cool thing you can do with this technique is just like I showed you on my last tutorial, the giant target, or just like the guy behind me that's one big Kumo spider web binding, you can do that. Whoops, let's put that in front of you guys. So I made this one yesterday also, and this is gonna be, um, a big square of fabric that just has one big spider web on it. This right here is where I started and that's where I tied around. And then I went up the length of it, closed off the end for the spider, crisscrossed back down to here, finished it off. And I had this part was all kind of, you know, loosey goosey like this. It was the edge of the fabric. And if I wanted that fabric to dye dark blue, I would leave that loose. But for this one, I decided to just keep going with my crisscrosses and come back. You can see I did a much looser crisscross on the, um, these are the corners of the square of fabric than I did for the center, which is going to be that spider web. So there we go. One big Kumo there. This is gonna be a piece of fabric with a whole bunch of different size ones on it. And again, some of those bubbles. Let's take a look once more, excuse me, at what that looks like. There's the bubbles, and there's the Kumo spider webs. All right, you guys, I hope you enjoyed that tutorial on how to do a Kumo Shibori binding. I will be back next week with another Shibori tutorial when I'm gonna show you how to make 
the teeth pattern. This is gonna be the first one where we're actually gonna sew our design into the fabric. So tune in next Friday for our next Shibori lesson. Until then, take care.